Hello and welcome to Aqua Rach and welcome to my daily holiday art series in which I am creating a new holiday or Christmas or winter themed project every single day between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it's been a lot of fun to try to think of new, cute, fun, and relatively simple projects that I can do each day. And it's really helping me feel that holiday spirit. So yesterday's topic was doing a pet portrait and I showed you a very simple template or formula through which you can create any kind of cat or dog and probably some other animals too, although cats and dogs are what I commonly do when I do commissions. And yesterday I did my cat Sherlock and today I'm going to do my two dogs, Watson and Hazel. And if you've seen my other videos, you probably have heard them snoring in the background because I typically do my voiceovers at night when they're snoozing because during the day they are just causing trouble left and right. And so I wanted that portrait to kind of reflect their personalities. They're very rambunctious. They are best friends with each other. I have had Watson quite a while longer than Hazel, and I always felt like he was a little bit lonely. He loved playing with other dogs. And so Hazel was at the local shelter, and I just ran over there and adopted her a couple of years ago, and they've been inseparable ever since then. And they are just like... I don't even know. They're they're just like siblings, you know, and they're always getting into trouble with each other and always getting tangled up with each other, especially when I'm walking them and they just kind of wind each other around the leashes and I have to stop throughout the walk to untangle them. So to make this a little bit more holiday themed, I decided to depict them as being kind of tangled up together in some Christmas lights. And so right now I'm just doing my sketch and you can see that I started out with that very simple formula where I just draw a circle for the head and then I kind of make this round body. And the way that you make this look like an individual animal really all comes down to just customizing the type of ears on the animal, the tail, the markings, maybe the size of the body. And so I found that just that very simple formula really works well for any kind of dog and any kind of cat. Sometimes it does take a little bit of creativity, but I've found maybe the most challenging is depicting an animal like a dog that has a longer nose because cats and then Boston Terriers like what I have, they have shorter noses. And so maybe I should actually show you how you can create a dog with a longer nose. Although the noses are typically foreshortened when they're looking head on at you, it still can be helpful if you have a, a particular dog that has an especially long nose so that it doesn't look like they just have like a flat face. All right, so here I am kind of just drawing some lines where the Christmas lights will be hanging off of. And I'm not really worried about drawing these in a realistic way, like they've actually gotten themselves tangled up in these lights. This, of course, is a completely fictional depiction of them, and it's meant just to be cute and simple. I thought about really tangling them up, but then I thought that would get really complicated really fast, and I do have a tendency to overcomplicate things. So I decided just to play it simple. So I drew the lines and now I'm just drawing where the lights will be. And then once I'm done with the sketch, I will just use my transfer paper. And here's my watercolor paper. It's I think it's just five by five inches, placing it underneath the sketch paper and then putting my transfer paper face down on top of the watercolor paper in between the sketch paper and the watercolor paper. And now I'm just applying pressure with my pencil to go over all of these lines so that the pressure 
will cause the carbon on the transfer paper to be transferred onto my watercolor paper. And I find that this is just the easiest and quickest way to easily transfer drawings onto watercolor paper. And transfer paper is very, very inexpensive and it lasts forever. I think I bought a pack of like 20 sheets of it and I've only used four sheets. And the only, I probably would still be using the first or second sheet, except sometimes I give them away like when I teach classes in person. Um, sometimes I just let students take those home with them. Like I'll tear it up into smaller squares and let them each have one. So it lasts a long time. It's very affordable. I really recommend it. Light boxes have become pretty affordable in recent years as well, and they're good to have, and I actually do have one. The reason I don't use it a lot is just because it's a little bit large. I have to plug it in, so I would use that for a more complicated transfer, but for these ones that are relatively simple and don't have that much line work, it is easy enough just to use that transfer paper, which I always have nearby. And now I'm going over all of the lines with India ink and my dip pen. I love using my dip pen, mostly just because it's such a tactile experience and it just feels very manual. And I think in recent years, I've just become very much about doing things in a more manual way. Not that I've ever really been into you know, like digital, I'm actually getting a little bit more into digital art just lately and starting to appreciate that as well. But a lot of times I'm really just in the mood to do things the quote unquote old fashioned way. And I just really love the experience of dipping my pen into ink and transferring that ink onto my paper. And I'm also developing quite a lot more control with this. You can also use some pens that are pre-filled they're called Micron pens and they're full of waterproof ink as well. So India ink tends to be waterproof in most cases, which means that you can apply watercolor on top of it without smudging the ink. And the same is true for Micron pens. And I do have some of those, but with those you get a more even line and it's much more predictable. It's uh, very easy to control in a manner but what you don't have control of is, you know, the pressure that you apply doesn't translate into like a thicker, bolder line like with the dip pen. So I think that's part of the reason I really like using dip pens lately. But if I have a situation where I just really need a very precise line and I don't want to make any risk of, you know, having a big blob of ink on the drawing, then I will just use those Micron pens. And now that I have everything outlined, except notice that I did not draw a black outline around the lights, I'm going to leave those without any kind of outline because I want those to appear a little bit softer. And now I'm just using my pen to add very short hatch lines to indicate the texture of short fur on my dogs. And typically when I do these short little hatch marks, I'll do it one of two ways. I'll either make them all going in the same direction and that makes the little illustration look a little bit flatter. But in this one, I'm actually trying to somewhat follow the contours of the outlines just to give a little bit more visual interest. I think that it looks good either way. So just to illustrate that there are a variety of ways that you can do this. And I think that this way just you know, gives a little bit more flow and a little bit more perception of some kind of dimension to the illustration. But I also think it's fun just to make everything really flat and just to make all of these hatch marks. Typically, I might make them all just vertical. And the hatch marks also help because when I apply the watercolor paint for the dogs, well, they're just black and white, and so they don't have a lot of color variation in them. And so just having these little hatch marks in here gives a little bit of a sense of variation within their coloring. And also when I do the watercolor for the black part of their fur, I'm not going to try to, you know, create an actual black because that would just flatten them and obviously it would eliminate all of these hatch marks anyway. So I'll actually 
use my watercolor so it's a little bit more of a wash. It'll be a little bit more gray so that you can actually see these hatch marks and so that the dogs will not just appear flat black. And I'll also give just a little bit of texture even to the white parts of their fur. And you wanna make sure, even though the India ink is waterproof, you just wanna make sure that the ink is fully dry before you apply any kind of water because it does dry relatively fast, but just depending on you know some areas where you might have more ink applied, for example, in the eyes, it's hard to see on the video, but there's a, quite a lot of ink in the eyes, and so those areas are going to take a little bit longer to dry. So I would say just give it a couple of minutes after you're done inking before you actually apply any water or just find some other area on the painting that you can work on while you're waiting. And then right now I'm just rinsing off my dip pen. You always want to clean it off immediately because the ink can just kind of accumulate on your pen and becomes a little bit um, dirty and, and kind of impacts the pen. And then I'm always going to move my ink out of the way so I don't accidentally knock it over at some point. And now I'm just using a tiny, tiny bit of masking fluid, and I'm applying a very small dot in the middle of where all these lights are. So going back to the lights, I didn't outline those in ink because I, again, want those just to be really soft. And I'm going to, I, I did my hatching in a way that kind of just avoided where the lights are. I know it's not very easy to notice from where we're looking at it right now, but I just tried to leave those areas white where the, I want the lights to be. And then I applied the masking fluid so there's just a tiny dot in the middle of those circles that are very, very lightly outlined. And now I'm going to go in with some color before I do any other painting on this piece. And I'm just going to apply a little bit of color within those light outlines of the lights around where I applied the masking fluid so that the idea is for the center of the lights where the light is the brightest, that will be white. And then outside we'll see the actual color of the Christmas lights. And I'm gonna keep the colors very simple. Right now I'm using permanent rose, which is kind of a cool red or a magenta red, which creates a really nice bright fluorescent effect. And then I will also use phthalo blue, which is a warm blue. And I also think it has a nice fluorescent effect. And then the last thing I will use um, is I'll mix some of my lemon yellow with my permanent rose. I want it to be more yellow, but um, I didn't want it to just be pure yellow because I thought it might be too light. But I think you could definitely try with just the uh, lemon yellow but I did mix in a little bit of permanent rose, so it's kind of a yellow-orange or an orange-yellow. And I think that the best colors to use for lights are basically these colors. Obviously, you can do other colors. You can do whatever color that you want, but I think that these kind of give the best fluorescent or bright effect. And then I'm just applying a little bit of that permanent rose. It has a little bit of yellow mixed in with it as well. And I'm just applying that to the ears of these puppies who right now are snoring, sitting right next to me. And for the moment, they're not causing any trouble. And unlike with my pet portrait of my cat Sherlock, I'm not going to paint the background on this, but I am going to put a decorative border around. So I've lightly erased the circle that I drew using the lid of a tin, just so that line wouldn't be so prominent. And now I'm going to go in, and what I basically do is I will paint a thin line, I'll give it a little bit of curvation. And I'm gonna go ahead and just paint all these lines in here before I even start really going into the leaves, just so that they're all in place. 
Then I just add a little bit of curvation around them, but then just generally follow that very, very light line that I have for the circle. And these don't all need to be the same. They don't have to be the same length. They can have different curvations. I think that just makes them look a little bit more organic and natural. And now I'm going to go in and start painting leaves. And since I'm obviously going to have to continuously replenish the mix of paint for these leaves in order to go around the whole thing, and it's really, you know, I think you could either try really hard to get a very consistent color going, but what I like to do is have even a little bit of variation within my color. So as I need to add more pigment to this mix, I'll start shifting it. So now I've added a little bit more yellow to the mix, whereas before it had a lot more blues. I used both my phthalo blue and my ultramarine blue. And then I'm just gonna kind of vary the amount of yellow I have in here so that as we work around this border, we're gonna get just a little bit of color variation so that it's a little bit less stagnant, it's a little more dynamic. And I don't worry too much about, you know, the shape of the leaves or anything like that. Just do them relatively quickly, leave them very simple because they are just kind of peripheral to the project. And again, you don't even have to put any kind of border on this at all if you don't want to. I often like to, I think just because I like painting these leaves and vines. And now I'm just going in and looking for areas that need to be evened out so that I have the leaves filled in in a more consistent manner throughout the border. And then to make this look just a little bit more Christmassy, I'm using that permanent rose again just to add some little dots that maybe are like berries or small flowers or something. Maybe they're confetti, who knows. And I'm just going to add those around the border as well. And I'm just applying those as dots and they're very watery, so they'll take a little while to dry. But... Usually I find that by the time I go around the entire border, the ones that I did first are pretty much dry by that point. And now just looking for areas that need to be filled in a little bit more. If I spill some paint or it, it kind of moves out of where I wanted it, I basically will just use a clean brush to dab some water on the area that I want to lift up and then I'll use my paper towel to press it to that area and hopefully lift up any of the pigment that I don't want to be there. And now I'm using, um, I honestly can't remember what this color is called, but I will go back and look and I'll just add a caption to the screen here. So. I'm using this to do the black parts on my dogs. And again, I don't want this to be extremely pigmented. My dogs do happen to be very uh, black. Some Boston Terriers are more brown, but mine are pretty much just black and white. But I want the texture of the hatching to show through, so I'm leaving it relatively watery. I don't really, it's kind of hard to balance between, you know, my dogs are black, they're not gray, but yet I need to find some balance between a very dark black and without making them look like they're gray. So as I paint my dogs, I'm just painting around the lights. You could, if, if your lights are all completely dry, which I'm not even sure if mine are, um, but what you could do if you wanted to is just apply more masking fluid on top of the lights so that you wouldn't have to worry about painting around those. But since there's not that much, I decided that I could just paint around those little circles where the lights are. And then on their faces, I don't worry about, you know, their eyes getting covered up. And I'm going to show you how to lift up some of the pigment a little bit if you need to lighten an area because basically you can hardly see where their eyes are. And I think that the eyes are really important. 
So I'll show you how you can lift that up. But for now, I'm just going to go all over with this color, just avoiding the lights and keeping in mind where the white parts of their markings are. And that's really what makes the pet portrait very customizable, even with this very generic and simple formula that you can use to start the initial design. It's mostly just going to be those little features like the ears, the nose, the tail, size of the body, and then the markings that really make this look like that specific pet. So now I'm using that same color I used on the black, but I added a lot more water as you can see. And I'm not applying this in a uniform way. I'm almost doing a hatching effect with my paintbrush, just so there's a little bit of texture. And I'm going to put this on the whites and you wouldn't have to necessarily do that. This, I think, if you wanted to just leave the white parts of the fur completely white, it just makes it look a little bit more minimalistic, which I also like that look, but I tend to, when I do these portraits, I tend to add a little something to even the white parts of the fur just because there's so much white in the background. If I was actually painting the background of flat color like I did with the cat portrait, then maybe it would be, I'd be more inclined to just leave their white fur completely white. And now I'm also just adding a tiny bit of shadow to their feet and around their bodies, just again to give a little bit more sense of dimension without going overboard. And we're just about done with this project. It's very simple. And one thing too I want to mention, you might notice, but I definitely will notice something like this, that my composition is a little bit off-center. So on some sides of the paper, I have a little bit more white space outside of that decorative border. What I'm going to do is just trim this down. So I'll just use a ruler and an X-Acto knife just to trim it down and make it a little bit more even on all sides. That's something that bothers me and probably bothers a lot of people <laughs> who are inclined to make images in the first place. It's just one of those things that you'll notice. All right, so to bring out the eyes just a little bit more, I have dipped my brush into water. There's no pigment on my brush right now, and I'm just applying water and kind of scrubbing into the pigment a little bit to loosen it up. And then I'm using my paper towel just to lift up those areas. So now you can see I've brought the eyes back. Maybe they're a little bit too much. <laughs> um, so what I wa really want to do is kind of lift up the pigment, bring those eyes back, and then I'm going to just apply it that same color again, but a little bit lighter so that the eyes stand out just a little bit more. And now finally, I'm lifting up all the masking fluid and we're done. So I'm just going to clean all of this up, get everything out of the way. And yeah, this was a fun and quick project and a great gift for anyone who has pets. So I really hope that you enjoyed this and I hope you might consider subscribing to my very young channel and I hope that you have a great day.